group is non-modifiable. We cannot do anything against it. That is getting old. That is being a male. Males have more strokes in younger ages. And having a family history of vascular diseases. We know families where almost every one of the grandparents and parents died from either heart attack or stroke. So if that is your family background, um, you have to be extremely careful with the modifiable uh, risk factors. Physical inactivity, high blood pressure, diabetes, high lipids, smoking, heavy alcohol intake, cardiac arrhythmias, and brain vessel stenosis. They are modifiable. We can do something about it. And it pays, as I said, when you look at the epidemiology of stroke in those countries where risk factor modification is available. However, those risk factors are additive. If you are hypertensive, you smoke, and you are a heavy drinker, then you have to add your risks. And it can get up to 20-fold the risk for stroke compared with someone of the same age and gender who does not have those risk factors. So something that, that is really of major importance. And the good news for, for the world is there are very cheap preventive measures, extremely cheap ones. No smoking. If smoking would stop now, 30% less myocardial infarctions and strokes in the world would be the result. So that even saves money, right? Because you don't pay the, this amount of, of money for your cigarettes. Less salt, also something that is really cheap if you know how much salt you take with your food, which is uh, uh, sometimes very well hidden. More exercise does only cost a little bit of um, equipment like new running shoes or something like that. Um, but uh, it also takes motivation, which sometimes is missing. So with these three, we could change the world by getting one out of three strokes prevented and two out of three myocardial infarctions prevented. So let's do it. And that is what the WHO is aiming at. And I can tell you, when you go to New York, to the General Assembly of the uh, uh, United Nations, where it will be on the agenda this year, later this year again, the lobby is full of salt and sugar manufacturers who do everything to fight upper limits of salt content in, for example, deep frozen pizzas, which have an incredible amount of salt. Or in tomato ketchup, which has an incredible amount of sugar in it, all hidden, you know. Then there are medications, aspirin, blood pressure lowering drugs, cholesterol lowering drugs, many of them now over the counter and, and uh, uh, the patent has run out so they are becoming cheaper, uh, which can also be used in middle income countries. Stroke treatment 30 years ago and still in most parts of the world today. Therapeutic nihilism Nobody wanted to take care of stroke patients. Neurologists were not interested at all. These were sick people. They were really sick, acutely sick. Nothing for neurologists of that generation. Stroke was not considered an emergency. There were times where it was not allowed to transport an acute stroke patient with flashlight and sirens. That was only for myocardial infarction and trauma. Thanks God, that has changed now. There was no priority for stroke patients in the emergency room. They were the last in line. 
and everything was more important than the stroke because you could not do anything for them. And then you put them into bed and said, he must rest. Don't touch him, don't do anything. Everything is dangerous. That was dangerous, not doing anything. And there was, as I said earlier, very little research for that. And one of the leading neurologists in the world, even a, a former president of the World uh, Federation of Neurology, said uh, there will never be a treatment for stroke. The brain dies too quickly. It became clear shortly thereafter, about 30 years ago, with some basic research, that it was not a black and white picture. Ischemia and cell death, or no ischemia and survival. There was a big gray zone in between. And this gray zone was an area of the brain where not enough blood arrived to keep it functioning, but there was still enough blood to keep the cells surviving, surviving like in a coma, but they could come out of that. And we realized, every one of us realized that there was more time than the five or 10 minutes of global ischemia that would kill all of the brain. And we also learned that this means the earlier someone comes, the more tissue will be available that can be revived. So the concept of time is brain or the clock is ticking and you're losing millions of brain cells by the minute of ischemia became very important. And we understood that over time, there was steadily more tissue that got finally infarcted. You see it in the lower line. Over time, the black thing is the core of the infarct. There is everything gone. Excuse me, but then over time, this core would grow and the area that can be saved will become smaller. So that meant time is brain and we have to be extremely quick. The mechanisms of brain ischemia were detected, understood, and people were thinking of, can we do something, can we give a drug that protects the the neuronal cells from this injury. Neuroprotection was the key word. And neuroprotection was a big field for 20 years. Millions and billions of dollars have gone into that field. There were at least 100 big clinical trials trying to protect the brain against ischemic injury and they all failed. None of those trials was successful. And the reasons were from animal experiments, you expected much more than you would actually observe. You used the wrong animal models, permanent occlusion. You used a wrong dosing. Doses that animals would tolerate are not tolerated by human beings because there are side effects that you don't see in animals. So in the end, this did not work. But something came up that worked. And it all depended on the arrival of brain imaging, in vivo brain imaging. And I call that the quantum leap in stroke medicine and probably beyond. Here is Professor Hounsfield from the EMI laboratory in England. For the older ones, the research that he could do at EMI was linked to the success of the Beatles. The Beatles were an EMI group. They published all their songs with EMI and with this sensational uh, success they had so much money that they put into research and the CT development is closely linked to that. So thanks to the Beatles, we have that. 
We don't have anything comparable to for the Rolling Stones yet, but uh, we, I, I certainly hope for that. And here is again something for the younger ones. When we saw this, a 64 by 64 matrix of the CT, of, of the brain, in a human being that is still alive. That was like an eye-opener. Nowadays, you would say, ah, come on, what, what do we see? A little bit of, of, of bone, some gray pixels, and some black thing in the middle, which are the ventricles. But you were able at that time with pictures like that to see whether there is a bleed or not a bleed. And if you have a stroke and it's not a bleed, then it's an ischemia. So it changed it all. The fact that it now looks like that, and that is simple CT, unenhanced. You know, th see this quality. But to have the middle picture was just the, it changed it all. That was the dawn of the acute therapies. And two new approaches came up that really heralded the rise of effective stroke therapies. The first was a strategy. It was not even a drug or a surgical procedure. It was a strategy. The strategy to bring stroke patients into specialized wards, so-called rehabilitation units, uh, predominantly in Britain and in Scandinavia. And that led to the development of stroke units. And stroke units are very effective treatments. The other was translating the management that our cardiology colleagues used for, at that time, about six to eight years, which was thrombolytic therapy, using intra-arterial drugs that would be given directly to the thrombus. And that was something that in Germany, in the US, in Japan, uh, almost simultaneously, researchers started to explore to use that also in stroke patients. So an interventional treatment of acute stroke. And that led to the recanalization therapies. So the stroke units, even with this slow, um, chronic approach, rehabilitation approach, lowered mortality by 20% and dependency also by 20%. In Germany and in parts of the United States and Canada, uh, we changed this approach from rehabilitation to acute intensive intervention, doing the same thing but earlier and more aggressive. And this was never tested by a randomized trial, but it became now the standard of what is being done in in the high-income countries when it comes to stroke unit um, treatment. And over time, it developed three levels, local stroke units that are CT-ready and uh, even could do thrombolysis, regional stroke units that, that even have neuroradiological expertise, sometimes vascular surgery or neurosurgery, and then the real big large stroke centers that can do uh, interventional therapies, have 18, 20 uh, uh, patients or so. In Germany, we now have 270 certified stroke units, 80 of them being comprehensive stroke centers. And uh, in our country, more than 80% of all stroke patients are treated on stroke units. Still not 100%. It will be difficult to reach the 100% everywhere, but 80% is a pretty good number here. And then came recanalization, the recanalization of occluded arteries. And I was lucky to eyewitness the first ever performed treatment of this type. That was following the cardiology mon uh, model um, with intra-arterial thrombolysis, and we did that in my hometown, Aachen, in Germany. Uh, Hermann Säumer was the radiologist. I was the critical care neurologist, and uh, we did the first uh, basilar artery local intra-arterial therapy 
These are the original films from 1979. That's the, the time where this started, 1979. Published uh, first in German because the journal Stroke wouldn't take it. They said uh, thrombolysis is dangerous, it should be avoided in Stroke, and this technique should not be studied further. If that would have happened, we would not be sitting here today, I can assure you, because this was the founding element for hyperacute interventions. It was later published in the American Journal of Neuroradiology, and uh, the story went on with intravenous recanalization. A, a very bright person from Leuven in, in, uh, in uh, Belgium, uh, Desiree Collen, um, created uh, the recombinant tissue plasminogen activator gene technology um, in the early uh, 80s. And uh, it was used in cardiology. And shortly thereafter, the first attempts for acute ischemic stroke were taken. So it, this was not I, now IV. You did not have to go to the angio suite for that. And after a couple of pilot studies, the randomized trials came. And those randomized trials came in the 90s. The NINDS study was the one that established the original three-hour time window for IV RTPA. And shortly thereafter, uh, the ECAS-3 trial widened this time window to four and a half hours. Still, this is a short time window. The, the patient gets a stroke. It must be recognized. The emergency system must function. The pa patient is transported to a unit where treatment can be done, needs to have a CT scan. For the trial, needs to have an informed consent and then treat it within four and a half hours. That is pretty tough sometimes, specifically if you live 100 kilometers away from the nearest center. That can be very bad for you. There is another example. It, it does not apply for many people, but uh, for some, and uh, those benefit a lot. There is one subtype of acute ischemic stroke that is almost, almost uh, deadly. This is called the malignant MCA infarction. And what that means is almost the whole hemisphere is acutely infarcted and it will expand with edema and water. It looks like that. And for those who, who are familiar with CT scans, you'll see immediately there is a massive infarction, and this massive infarction presses over all structures of the midline to the other side, and the, the, the healthy brain is compressed. And that cannot be survived. Those patients die from a massive increased uh, um, uh, pressure within the uh, cranium. And there was a very simple uh, approach that we took, and that was, if there is not enough space inside the skull, you have to create the space. And creating the space is widening the skull, and you do that by a large piece of bone that you take off. It looks like that in a 3D re reconstruction, but that allows the brain to swell to the outside. There were a couple of early case studies, and they suggested you bring down mortality from 80% to 30%. So 80% to 30%, unheard of. But people said, could it be that if you do that and they survive, they survive in the most severe damage state so that it would be better if they were dead? And this was a very valid question. And this valid question was answered by, again, a randomized controlled trial. 
randomizing to surgery versus no surgery. A difficult, a difficult study to do because with the randomization process, the computer decides about life and death. When you are in the conservative arm, your likelihood of dying is 80%. That we knew. And if you're operated, it's like 30%. That we knew as well. We did not know what the quality of survival was. The randomized trials showed it. And this is what you see here. The upper line is the distribution of outcome with standard therapy. 71% mortality and only one out of 42 patients surviving in a kind of okay state. This is 22% mortality and now comes the important part, the blue one. These are the patients who survive completely dependent. These are the ones we were afraid of. And, and they are very few. All the others benefit largely from it. And this is now also true for patients uh, up to 80 years of age. So a massive effect even in elderly patients. And the next and the last new things, thing is just one and a half years old. And that is mechanical thrombectomy. Thrombectomy is around for 10 years, but